Well, I guess this is going to be on the internet, so I have to be careful. <laughs> and uh, I'll introduce myself a little uh, in a little longer fashion because it's going to be on the internet, and um, not everybody may know me. I'll give you a little bit of my background. I went to medical school and graduate school in Buffalo. I did my residency at Tufts New England Medical Center, Boston, in internal medicine. I did two fellowships in immunology, one at Mayo Clinic, the other one at Harvard. Then I joined the faculty at Harvard and came to Stony Brook in the early 1980s. And there I began to become involved in tick-borne infectious diseases, specifically Lyme disease. Um, so I've had a long career as it was. And a lot of the mistakes that were made in Lyme disease, I made. So I'm going to hopefully clear up some of that. I was on the CDC committee that put together the laboratory diagnostic criteria. And I was, uh, over the years, I continued to interact with CDC. Also FDA, NIH, and other government agencies. So right now, uh, I, left, I was chief of the uh, immunology at Stony Brook, but I left 18 years ago, and I've been at New York Medical College since, and I'm a professor in microbiology, immunology, uh, and medicine at uh, New York Medical College, which is uh, where my research group is. So we have still doing a lot of very active research. So that's sort of a quick background. I have a lot of disclosures. I have, I don't know, 14, 15, 16 patents. Some of them are licensed to uh, companies, but I, I don't receive any direct payments from uh, uh, any pharmaceutical or industry for any, any of this work. I've been funded primarily by NIH research grants over the years, and fortunately, uh, I, I've done very well. I, literally millions of dollars worth of uh, NIH grant support over the years. So why talk about um, tick-borne infectious diseases? <clears throat> it's a real problem, especially in this region. Northeastern United States has got a lot of tick-borne infectious disease, and it's a problem throughout, really, the United States, Europe, and other parts of the world. Now, Lyme disease is obviously one of the most uh, prominent ones, but there's other ones, too. There's uh, Borrelia miyamotoi, which is tick-borne relapsing fever, which is also carried by ticks in this region. Babesia, which is a malaria-like parasite carried by the ticks. And <clears throat> anaplasmosis, ehrlichiosis. The one that scares me the most, Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Although the name Rocky Mountain spotted fever sounds like it's only in the Rocky Mountains, there's more on the East Coast than there is in, in, the, uh, in the Rocky Mountains. Actually, the hotbed of Rocky Mountain spotted fever in the United States is the Carolinas. And that has a, a, a fairly high mortality rate, 20 25% mortality rate untreated. <clears throat> We're starting to see Powassan virus in, in, carried uh, in some of the ticks now. Powassan virus, it causes encephalitis. It's a, it's a, a virus uh, that uh, it's a little scary. Tularemia has got some um, <clears throat> publicity, but tularemia is not that much of a problem. Tularemia is actually a class one biological warfare agent. It causes, uh, <clears throat> can cause uh, severe pneumonia and, and high mortality rate. It's, it gets in the rabbits, and when you know when you got tularemia in your area is when all the rabbits start dying. And then there's other viruses which are starting to appear, Heartland and Bourbon virus. Heartland is most, it's really, it's called Heartland because it's mostly in the Midwest. And we have not seen cases of it here on the, on the East Coast of the United States yet, but you have to you worry about it. So what are my objectives today? My objectives today is to help you understand tick-borne infectious disease a little bit better and uh, to try to give you some background on how we test for it, and what some of the pitfalls have been, and some of the myths that are, that are out there. Uh, <clears throat> so um, unfortunately, there's a lot of myths. One of them is that Lyme disease is a North American disease. It's not. 
It was reported in Europe over a century ago, well over a century ago. So it's a European disease that somehow got transported into North America. And it probably occurred during the colonial period. <clears throat> and it came into probably Montauk and to the Cape Cod area. And it probably came on domesticated animals that were being brought in from uh, parts of uh, central Germany. And uh, it's established itself. And actually, the bacteria that causes Lyme disease, Borrelia burgdorferi, in the United States, <clears throat> there's many vari more varieties in Europe. So it's, it's a bit more complicated in Europe than it is in the United States. So, <clears throat> and it's, you know, some myth was that it was released from Plum Island. That's nonsense. It's really old, and uh, it's been around for a long time. So now, what do we think of Lyme disease? It's certainly not what we thought of in the 1980s. It's, we made mistakes in the 1980s. So I'm going to try to talk about the, the history and how we developed the tests for Lyme disease. Uh, and a lot of that was developed here at Stony Brook. And I should say that <clears throat> Stony Brook, uh, had a reputation of having a good Lyme test. There were two Lyme tests at Stony Brook. There was the one in my research lab, and there was one in the pathology lab. And I had nothing to do with the one in the pathology lab. And I never used it, because I didn't think it was very good. That's the dirty truth. So, as I said, it was first described, well described in Europe in uh, the early part of the 20th century well before World War I. But it had been no talked about in the 19th century prior, prior to that. So, and in the United States, it wasn't discovered in Connecticut. The first reports of Lyme disease actually came in Wisconsin. Scalmenti, who was a Wisconsin dermatologist, um, <clears throat> uh, recognized it. And ironically, it was in two deer hunters who came in with the rash of Lyme disease. And he described it. And he, and he was looked at the European uh, medical literature and said, this is what it is. So that's the first, this first really good description of what we now know as Lyme disease in the United States. And then <clears throat> Mast and Burroughs, who were two dermatologists working at New London Naval Base, reported a, a cluster of cases of, of the rash of Lyme disease in uh, Connecticut. Now, the big thing was uh, Alan Steer, when he was at Yale, may, uh, looked at a cluster of people with arthritis. And he emphasized that. This, he, they called it Lyme arthritis. And he ignored almost everything else but Lyme arthritis. And when you think of it today, that still sticks. You think of Lyme disease, you think of arthritis. That's wrong. It's much more complicated than that. So <clears throat> now, what we realized in the 80s was that it's, it's not just arthritis. It's a systemic infectious disease. Well, what does that mean? It affects multiple organ systems. It affects all various different parts of the body. And <coughs> <clears throat> so, that was um, an important concept. The um, <clears throat> discovery of the bacteria that causes Lyme disease actually was here on Long Island. Jorge Benash, who uh, was uh, chair of microbiology at uh, Stony Brook and now is vice dean for research there, was part of the team that identified a new bacteria collected in ticks from Eastern Long Island. And he had worked with Willie Bergdorfer when he, uh, during his student days and his, his postdoc days. And uh, the, he sent the, the samples to Willie Bergdorfer, right? Willie Bergdorfer, who was working at NIH Rocky Mountain Labs. And they, that was the original discovery of the bacteria that causes Lyme disease. Hence its name, uh, Borrelia bergdorferi, after, after Willie Bergdorferi. So, Jorge really played a, a very prominent role in all this. And he's a nice guy, he's a friend of mine. So, what about today's views of, of Lyme disease? Well, there's a lot of misinformation and a lot of myths. I, I've already said um, <clears throat> a thing about arthritis, but 
people talk about the rash of Lyme disease. How common is it? You, you see on the internet and some people say it's less than 50% of people get it. That's not true at all. Because when they did really good studies of the vaccine trials and they scrutinized people very well, it was not that at all. It was in the 90s. There's another thing is that there's somehow a delay in the immune response to it. So you cannot <clears throat> detect antibodies against the bacteria that causes Lyme disease early in the course of disease. Nope, that's not true at all. Your immune response to Lyme is just like every other infectious disease. And I'll show you more about that in a minute. <clears throat> the thing that's, that's different is that the, te the test <clears throat> had very bad uh, targets for the, for the antibodies. So it was not the humans that were causing the problem. It was that we didn't have a good test. The other thing is poor outcomes are common. That's not true at all. If you catch uh, and treat Lyme disease early, you have an excellent chance of having a full recovery. Good. Timing is everything. Again, I've already mentioned this. Um, another thing that was out there, you remember years ago there was a Lyme disease vaccine. And Steer, who, uh, who was promoting arthritis for instance, he um, came up with a theory that, this, that that vaccine could cause autoimmunity. And he wrote a paper about it. Now, scientifically, that paper was awful. He was totally wrong, a absolutely wrong. And he's lucky I didn't review the paper because I, I knew better. <laughs> but it became out there. And it, now there's no Lyme disease vaccine. Now there's one in trials now and it's sort of based on the same technology. It's going to be interesting to see how that, that, uh, that comes about, but I'm not sure um, how acceptable it's going to be. Is it a good idea? I don't know. I've see, I'll make that judgment when I see the data. <clears throat> so what's the key thing to look for? Well, the skin lesion of Lyme disease is really important because if you recognize it, just treat it. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to test it. Just give people antibiotics, and they do well. So it develops primarily at the site of a tick bite. Now, the trouble with these ticks, they're small. You miss them. They don't itch. They don't burn. But you get, to, you get this rash, and I'll show you what it looks like. It's characterized by it's a red expanding lesion. It doesn't itch, doesn't burn, and doesn't hurt. Usually you feel pretty well when you have it. Develops in 85 to 90% of cases. And it's the only manifestation of Lyme disease anywhere. I, this says North America, but it's anywhere, which is characteristic. Everything else is not. Everything else can occur in plenty of other illnesses. So you can't say, I made a clinical diagnosis in the absence of a, of a skin lesion. You can assume it, but you can't make the diagnosis, and, and that's important. Uh, so you really need the laboratory to help you out. Now, everybody knows, well, the Lyme disease skin lesion is a bullseye, right? That's, that's why people say less than 50% of people develop the skin lesion. Because if you look for this, you're going to miss it about 50% of the time. You're going to miss it. You see that? Yeah, OK, that's it. And that was promoted as the classic. And you still hear it. Newspapers, everybody. Oh, yeah, bullseye. Well, there's another bull. Uh, that I would say about that, and you can fill that in. That's more common. Yep, a red, a large red, painless, expanding skin lesion. That's that's the that's the rash of Lyme disease. You see that? That's diagnostic, and it's more common. <clears throat> 
And there's variations too. You can get atypical lesions. This looks like little blisters, and it is. So you gotta be experienced and know the differences in the different skin lesions. And I know plenty of doctors have no clue, which is, makes a difference. I mean, we ran the, the, um, the, the Lyme disease clinical group at, at Stony Brook for a long time. So I saw it, literally thousands of different variations of this. And you gotta be careful. But characteristic, it always is red and it always expands. So you see that, be suspicious. And even if you make a mistake and you say, I'll give you uh, some antibiotics for that and I, may, and, and I misdiagnosed it, overdiagnosed it, didn't hurt you that much. <laughs> and how long does it usually last? It can last for about three days to weeks. And it grows. And it, as it expands, it usually fades. So, and it's, it's big, it gets big. So it's not, and if you get a tick bite, you're gonna get a quarter size or a half dollar size little lesion. That's not, Lyme, that's not the rash of Lyme, because the rash of Lyme disease, it gets big. And one of the tricks, it's really easy to do. You have a, a red area on your skin, take a pen, just draw a circle around the out leading edge of it, and wait a day. Because the real thing will be outside that circle really, very rapidly. And that, that really means go to the doctor. Now, what happens? It starts off, that's a local infection in your skin. But it gets into your bloodstream and it spreads. And one of the real hallmarks of spread is multiple erythema, erythema migrants or multiple rashes. And that's not that the guy this person, I'm not sure it's a man or woman, but uh, fe fell in with a bad batch of ticks with rolling around. That's one lesion spread of the disease. And you, that can happen. And it can be faint. I don't know how this, you can see this, but these are multiple lesions that are faint. So it doesn't have to be this prominent red uh, area. And that's important. So now, acute disseminated disease, that means spread through your bloodstream to all parts of your body. So 10 to 15% will have multiple skin lesions. But you can also get neurologic manifestations. The most common is facial nerve palsy. People call it Bell's palsy, but technically it's not Bell's palsy. Uh, but <clears throat> it means one side of your face stops working, or both sides of your face stops working. You can't smile, you can't blink. Uh, Meningitis, that is fairly uncommon. Maybe 5% of people with acute disseminated will get that. It's a, it's a mild form of meningitis. Headache, low, uh, uh, but it it's, means that you have an infection in your central nervous system. Cardiac involvement occurs, it was um, well less than 10%. And, it's very characteristic. You make the uh, diagnosis on an EKG. Normally, your heart, it, the beat starts in the top half of your heart and it's conducted down to the bottom. So your heart beats synchronously. First the top, then the bottom. And you get a disconnect between that, those normal signaling pathways. And that's called AV block, top half and the bottom half of the heart. And that occurs in less than 10% of people. <clears throat> so now, facial nerve palsy. It's the most common acute neurologic thing. And it's, uh, other neuropathies can occur in the facial, but it's really rare. But just if you get facial nerve palsy here on Long Island, in the summertime, you say, wow, oh, it's Lyme. It's not most likely not Lyme, because there's, it's, it, it, facial nerve palsy is not an uncommon phenomenon. Most commonly, it's a secondary to a viral infection. So we looked at this, actually John Halpern and I, when we were at Stony Brook, looked at it, and we found that 25% of people in this region, which is one of the most heavily endemic areas for Lyme disease, had Lyme disease, uh, those, you know, so, one in four of people presenting with Bell's palsy had Lyme disease. 
I mean, 75% didn't. So you can't make that assumption, except if it's bilateral, both sides, it's Lyme disease. Because that, that's uh, one of the few things that gives you biological. Lyme meningitis, you get <clears throat> white cells in your cerebral spinal fluid. Unlike bacterial meningitis, where it's primarily something called polys, polymorphic nuclear cells, um, this is more what's called monocy monocytic, uh, which is, uh, that's probably too much information. <laughs> and, and your other parameters are uh, fairly normal. Your glu the amount of uh, sugar in your cerebral spinal fluid is normal. Proteins up a little bit, but it's a very different picture than bacterial meningitis. Late infection. This is where the controversy starts. We know that local inflammatory processes are what predominate. What does that mean? That means it's not, it doesn't cause a lot of systemic types of problems. Arthritis or neurologic abnormalities uh, are what you see. And it, you don't get fevers or things like that with it. You don't, you're not getting constitutional things. You're not getting weight loss, fevers, uh, and a lot of stuff like that. <clears throat> now, this is uh, an important statement. Lyme disease is very rarely the cause of fatigue or depression. How can I say that? Can it? Yes. Does it? If someone comes in with fatigue or depression, is that Lyme? And I'll show you why that that's not very good. <clears throat> arthritis. Classically, it's a large joint arthritis. It affects almost always the knee. You get a lot of swelling, a lot of fluid in the knee, but it doesn't hurt very much. Why doesn't it hurt? Arthritis hurts like hell. The reason why is because Lyme disease affects peripheral nerves. It makes it numb. So you've got to disconnect. And that, that's important. And it usually waxes and wanes spontaneously, even if you don't treat it. And they were early on at Yale, they didn't treat it, it just went away. And uh, you don't usually get a lot of inflammation, not a lot of heat and swelling uh, associated with it. It was really emphasized in the 80s. Now, if you look at population studies, and the Canadians did a great study of it, less than 0.03% of those presenting with Lyme disease present with arthritis. The overwhelming majority of people with Lyme disease present with a skin lesion. So it's become rare, but you, you don't see that out there. Even doctors don't know that. Now, late neurologic disease. Encephalitis, you can get inflammation. That's True encephalitis is fairly rare. And now with the viral stuff like Powassan and Heartland virus and these others out there, uh, it's, gonna, it's hard because if you get bit by a tick, do you have viral encephalitis or do you have Lyme? And that's starting to blur things. And we didn't know a lot of this in the 80s. We didn't know that, the, that there were these Encephali encephalitis viruses that were carried by ticks. If you look in Europe, there's Fruit Summer Cronkite, which is, which is a viral encephalitis, which there's a vaccine in Europe for, which is people recognize, and it's carried by the same ticks that carry Lyme disease in Europe. So there's a lot of overlap, and there's more research that needs to be done. As far as other parts, your peripheral nervous system can be affected. What is peripheral neuropathy? It's, it's the nerves that are outside the central nervous system, brain, spinal cord. So uh, the most common cause in our society of peripheral neuropathy is actually diabetes. So, but numbness. It's usually not painful, it's usually numbness. And that, that's, that's important. So it's in the, yeah. So you, you hear a lot about chronic Lyme disease or post-Lyme disease syndrome. 
We don't have a good definition for either one of those things. And it's quite controversial. So we need to define things better. And the way we're gonna, we have to do it is really do a very good prospective study. In other words, get patients right from the beginning and then follow them and see what happens. And that's never really been done in a systematic way. So we have, we have information gaps. And we have people that are absolutely convinced that they're right and they, they're very evangelistic about it. But there's no data. We need more data. And, you know, does it occur? You know, what does it mean? So we have to define things. And I, I, like, to, I like to make things concrete. Now, could it occur? Yeah. Does it occur? I don't know. We have to do the studies to figure it out. Um, so now, chronic Lyme disease, people said, well, you can't cure the infection. Well, when you look at things with modern technology, you, if you treat people with antibiotics, you can't find the organism anymore. So that, that, that speaks strongly against ongoing infection. The, the, uh, the issue is, could you have some other process. Now we know that there's post-infectious immunologically mediated diseases out there. And a lot of people with, who have an infectious disease go on and have ongoing symptomatology after, and we don't have good explanations for it. Now, what's cu currently out there, long COVID. What is long COVID? That needs to be studied. And there are NIH studies looking at, at that because we see that in other infectious diseases as well. You get an infectious disease, you get, you, you get a problem. I mean, a classic was rheumatic fever. A strep throat affects your heart, cure the strep throat, you still have, still have a rheumatic fever. It's, it's not that, you, that your heart's infected, it's that you have an immunologic process. So we need answers, in which we don't have. Now, I talked about depression and fatigue. There's really a big problem in defining syndromes based on symptoms. A symptom is something that the patient says to me. I can't, uh, I feel tired, I feel sick, I've, um, I, have, I have pain. A sign is swelling, fever, something I can measure. So if you look at most of these things, they're symptoms. So fatigue and depression are symptoms. So if you look at what's the incidence of fatigue in our population? Well, population studies said 20 to 30% of healthy adults report fatigue. Pain. About 11% of uh, adults report pain syndromes. And they can't find anything. So, uh, and then there was another study which is 80% of the general population experienced one symptom of pain in any six week period. And 81% of healthy university students and hospital staff describe at least one such symptom over any three day interval. Who doesn't have pain? I'm, in a, I'm an old guy. My knee hurts. I played lacrosse when I was in college. You know, I got, I got pain in my hands. So, you know, so we have a conundrum. So if someone comes in and they're, they're, they have pain or fatigue, I can't say that's Lyme disease because if I look at the incidence of Lyme disease in the population, I look at the versus the incidence of these various things, I get overwhelmed by the sea of this is a common disorder. You gotta be careful. So summing up, the skin lesion is the only unique manifestations. Fatigue and joint pain are nonspecific and common. Can't base any, any specific diagnosis or anything on it. Arthritis is rare. And even in late Lyme disease, it's only about 7%. So there's been an overemphasis on some of these things. And we need better answers. We need to do the studies to get, get the answers. And, Anybody that says they know it all, be careful of. <laughs>
I always tell people, if someone says, I'm a Lyme disease doctor, uh -uh. don't see that person. <laughs> There's no such thing. I am not a Lyme disease doctor. I'm a clinical immunologist, and I happen to do infectious disease immunology. But I don't pretend that I know it all. Now, one of the things that's important to understand the laboratory diagnosis of Lyme disease is to understand what happens when you get exposed to anything, a virus or bacteria, and your body fights it. it. It makes an immune response. We know a lot, we've heard a lot about antibodies lately with the COVID epidemic. So what, you, what happens is that your body quickly responds to anything, and we know it does because we're alive. So if you don't do this, you you get eaten. So the first antibody you make is called IgM, and that occurs within days of an infection. The, soon after, you start getting a more mature response, and that's called immunoglobulin G, or IgG. And this is stereotypic of all the immune responses. It doesn't matter. It's COVID, Lyme. Uh, strep, everything. So that's how your immune system works. The other thing I should mention before I go on is that once you make an immune response, your immune system has memory. If I take uh, and drew blood samples on all you guys and I measured childhood diseases, I can tell you what childhood diseases you have because you have antibodies against whatever you had as a child. You know, the standard of care in the United States is to do a rubella test on pregnant women. Why? Because it used to be if you had rubella, uh, you don't want rubella during pregnancy, but if you had rubella as a child, you were immune. It told you not to worry. So a positive rubella test was good news. So if you have a positive antibody test against something, it doesn't mean you're infected by any means. It means you have, you, your immune system recognized that, that, that agent in the past. And that's an important point. So what's the history of the laboratory diagnosis of Lyme disease? Well, the, the, the tests, a lot of the tests started at Stoneybrook because Jorge Ben Ash had the bacteria that caused it. So he started to build the first Tests. And it was simple. One of the ways you have of looking for uh, the presence of uh, things is to look, for, is there antibodies against the bacteria or the virus that, that, you're, that you think the person's infected with? That means exposure. That's all it means. So it was in the early 80s that they discovered the bacteria. <clears throat> and then the first assays were, they just grew it up in the lab and ground it up, put it on, a, on in a test, and asked the question, does the person have antibodies against any of these proteins that are in this bacteria? Yes or no? Okay. First test. Terrible test, but it, was, it worked. Oh. Now, it was so terrible because one of the things, and I'll show you some pictures later why it's terrible, is that it, there were a lot of false positives. So you, what you were starting to see is that it took normal healthy people, 40, 50 percent of them had, were positive in these early tests. Didn't mean, so he started to get, what does it mean? You know? So then they developed what's something called a Western blot. A Western blot is to take the, the bacteria, separate the proteins of that bacteria by size and put it on a strip. And that's like a barcode. So then the question is, well, if you have antibodies against this bacteria, what do you make an antibodies to? And you can, just, you can start to look at the different size proteins. Is it against, uh, uh, and, and just get a, a, a pattern. It's like reading a barcode. So that, that was an improvement. And then they established that you had to have a first-tier test, which was, do you have antibodies against the bacteria at all? 
And then if you do, which, which of, the, of these, these bands or size proteins are you making a, an immune response to? And that was called the two-tier test. That's still in place today. It's totally obsolete. And I was on the committee that put that together, and that was supposed to be interim. Interim meaning two or three years until we get something better. Got locked in. And, and, all, and so many people uh, attribute magical characteristics to their ability to interpret a Western blot. And I'll show you why. They're, delus they're delusional if, you, if they think that that, that works. Oh. So <clears throat> here's a Western blot. It looks like a barcode. The, the number is, is weight, the weight of the protein in that band. So what you can, so they said, well, we want to look at, we know IgM comes up first, so we look for IgM in, in the first month of infection, and we look for the different bands at certain sizes. And then the, uh, we you know we have more mature immune response, and we also broaden out our immune response, so we can look for other bands. So that's what, what, that's what it was. But I can tell you right now, we had no clue what was in these bands. They were just stripes on a, uh, on a band, and it was weight. It, was, it wasn't, we didn't characterize those proteins. So they were not defined. And guess what? That was, a, that was a 1D gel. When you take and separate each band, so now you have the weight, but you separate it by charge, you soon find out you don't have one protein at anything. You have multiple proteins. So each one of those bands may have two or three proteins in it. Some are more specific, some are less specific. Now that makes it very complicated, and we didn't know that. So there was a lot of, a lot of noise in these, in these things. So if you compare this to that previous one, you see it's different. And we now have an issue. And then the other thing we found out is that certain proteins in these bands are common proteins to other bacteria. The classic one is at the 41 protein. If you do sensitive 41 assays, you find 40 to 50% of the normal population has antibody against 41. What does that mean? <laughs> Another one is at 60, over 16%, it's what's called a common bacterial protein. It's a protein that's found in most bacteria. Same thing as uh, at 30, at 66, and there are others. So what we have in here are proteins which are totally nonspecific. So if you look at the New York State criteria for uh, equivocal Lyme disease test is to have one band on a Western blot. What does that mean? It means nothing because if you look at Western blot results in, in healthy blood donors, you're going to get one band on 40 to 50% of them. So you, you just, and, these pe and there are pe people that make a living out there uh, <clears throat> producing Western blot results that don't make any sense. They just make up their own criteria. And there was a study of, a, of what, quote, Lyme specific labs that was done out of Columbia and showed <clears throat> it's almost random. Almost random as far as its ability to pre correctly predict it. So, got to be careful. So now, we, there were advances. One of the problems with uh, Putting, growing the bacteria in the lab is that when you passage it, it loses its ability to express proteins. It becomes an empty sack of nothings. The other thing is if you culture it, it doesn't have, this, have the same proteins 
that it expresses uh, in, inside the body. So you're missing a whole set of, of things that occur that your immune system sees, but it, you don't see in, 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 in this artificial situation of the laboratory. So we discovered that in, in the late uh, 90s. And they, there was a lot of testing, and something called C6 was a very prominent test uh, until just recently. And um, it's now virtually useless because what happens is that that particular protein cross-reacts with uh, a whole set of other uh, bacteria. So, you, so the false positive rate is very high and uh, you have a problem. So <clears throat> my lab has what, looked for where on the protein do, does the antibody bind? So we can then pick out specific regions of a protein that are more specific to the bacteria. And we, so we, we get rid of some of this, all this background noise, because the signal to noise ratio of these tests is terrible. And we gotta refine that. <clears throat> so what's the standard sensitivity of these tests. I already said that people develop an immune response, but if you look at sensitivity in uh, our current labs, it's not very good in early disease because we don't have the right targets. And, and you, you got so much background noise that you, you can't find the, the antibody. It hasn't risen that high that we can just differentiate between the signal and the noise. So that's the myth that you don't get a good immune response to, in, to this. It's not that we don't get a good immune response. We, our test is terrible. And that's the difference. So <clears throat> once you develop late disease, your, the sensitivity of the test could really get, get very good, even these nasty ones, the old ones. Now, this is a study from CDC, and I just wanted to <clears throat> point out one of, the, one of the problems. And if you look here, healthy, non-endemic controls. That means taking blood bank, where people screened, make sure they're not sick, from areas where there's no Lyme disease. C6, which was a commonly used test, 4% were positive in that. Totally, they didn't have Lyme disease. No chance. So we have a lot of background stuff, and the whole cell assay, that's that cultured bacteria stuff, 23%. So we have a lot of problems with that, even to, to this day, and we're still working on that. So now what we're, the next generation are probably peptide-based assays where you can just take a little small piece of, a, of the protein that's specific and put them together and you start to build better, better assays. So, <clears throat> what's the summary? CDC's uh, Western blot introduction was necessitated because the test had too many false positives. The bands were not characterized. Uh, and a lot of stuff was missing. Now, I should say that <clears throat> one of the things that's very important and I see it all the time. You had Lyme disease, say two, three years ago. Your doctor said, draws a test. It's positive. He says, you have Lyme disease. Is he right or wrong? The answer is absolutely wrong because your immune system has memory and a positive antibody test is not predictive of infect active infection. Not a chance. You cannot judge disease activity based on, on an antibody assay. Now, the other thing that, uh, now you saw that th those false positives numbers. Now, in a region like this, heavily endemic, the incidence of Lyme disease is less than one in a thousand population. What's 4% of a thousand? 40. So if I at random 
take a thousand people in, around here, draw their blood, and I will get 41 positives, theoretically. 40 will not have the disease, and one will. So the predictive value of a Lyme serology is terrible. <laughs> terrible. Yet, how many people that you know, I have Lyme disease because my doctor drew a test and it's positive. Bad medicine. <laughs> so you have to be very, very, very cautious. So that is, that is important. So I'll, I'll just stop talking about Lyme disease for a second. I'll talk about some other in infectious disease. Now, what are the other serious ones that are around here? Well, one of the more common ones is Babesia, a malaria-like parasite which infects red blood cells. Again, are there tests for it? Yes. If I do an antibody test for Babesia, what does it tell me? You were exposed to Babesia. Does it have any relationship to active disease? No. How do I know you have active Babesia? I look at your red blood cells and I see little dots in the red blood cells because Babesia is an obligate parasite of red blood cells. That's where it is. So now, is the sensitivity of looking for those dots high? Well, it depends on the skill of who's looking. The answer is no. The other way I can do it, and there was a lot of talk about PCR with COVID, right? So I can look for the genetic material of, of that organism in your red blood cells. So if you have a positive PCR, that means you have the genetic material of that parasite in your red blood cell. That is a decent test. It's a little expensive, but it's a decent test. That's the only, so either seeing it or PCRing it are the only way you can say that person has, has Babesia. Now, the majority of people who get Babesia in, in this area are asymptomatic. They don't get sick. If you're immunocompromised or you're old or you don't have a spleen, you can, you can get very, very sick. And I've seen people on respirators uh, with Babesia in ICUs. So, you know, putting things in, in context is, is very important. Um, there's one, uh, we're starting to see a new species of tick called the Lone Star Tick. And for meat eaters, this is very important because that tick causes meat allergy. A bite of that tick can, in a low percentage of people that get it, get meat allergy. So you have a delayed, severe allergic reaction to, to, to beef and pork. And it's called alpha-gal, which is uh, uh, a sugar molecule. And uh, that's important. Some of the others that are out there, anaplasma um, is, is also a thing. And that gives you a, a, uh, a viral-like illness, which is pretty nonspecific. Um, as far as treatment of acute uh, Lyme or acute anaplasma, doxycycline works great. Two weeks of uh, 100 milligrams twice a day is curative in most people. Uh, Babesia is a, a lot of time you don't need to treat it, but Babesia is contaminating our, our blood supply, and that, that could that's an issue for for blood the blood supply. How does it do that? It's carried in the red blood cell, so you could be asymptomatic and uh, donate blood, and, and you got Babesia in your uh, in your blood, and you, you don't know it. And they're not screening for it. It's too expensive. Um, my husband has it. What? My husband has it, and my grandson has heart-related lines. He's in military hospital right now. OK. It's very treatable. You know, cardiac, cardiac is usually acute. He's stage two. Well, so he's got second degree heart block. Yeah, he'll, he'll, he should have a really good outcome. He's in North Shore Hospital? Yeah. 
Yeah, they know, they know what they're doing. They're pro is he on intravenous antibiotics? Oh, he's on ceftriaxone. Uh, the, the efficacy of that is extremely high. We no, it will, he'll do, he should do very well. We established that uh, the ceftriaxone studies uh, I led at Stony Brook in the 80s and 90s. So that, and, and our outcomes were great. So. Uh, Ray, uh, I've had uh, COVID twice. Yes. Because you're not, you're not active, you don't actively have it right now. Well, the trouble is, is that uh, COVID mutates. And what, if you look at, it's like, it's like flu. I mean, if I got a flu shot three years ago, am I protected against this strain of flu this year? No. So you, you're seeing mutation. And fortunately, the, the new Omicron B5 is much less... Um, uh, uh, serious as far as clinical outcomes than, than the original um, lab strain out of uh, Wuhan. The, 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 uh, uh, and then the, the Alpha and the Delta were much more serious infection. So we've seen an evolution of, uh, of COVID with time, making it less virulent and more contagious, which is, which is uh, sort of historically accurate. If you look at the 1918-1919 uh, influenza epidemic, that original strain was quite deadly. Yet by the mid-20s, it, it had attenuated. And the ancestors of that 1918-1919 circulate with regular, uh, regularity throughout the world. So uh, we still get the... Uh, the, the sort of the, uh, the, uh, um, those uh, original strains, you know, their, their, their progeny, as it were, still circulate, but it's not as deadly as it was at that point. So we, you see that a lot in infectious disease. So, and the answer is that, first of all, <coughs> uh, this may be too much information, but if I give you an injection of a vaccine, I stimulate what's called systemic immunity. That means I produce uh, an immune response in the body. I do not get a mucosal uh, immunity. So I'm not, do, I'm not getting, because your, your immune system has got compartments. And your mucosal immunity is very different than systemic immunity. And um, natural we now know natural infection causes mucosal and systemic immunity, and it's better than just systemic immunity. And there are, uh, that's true of a lot of infectious diseases. And now it's, uh, it's become obvious with COVID. So there's a number of things. The vaccine does not prevent infection or carriage. It prevents death. It's very good at stopping you from dying but it's not so good at preventing you getting infected or, uh, or being able to spread it. <coughs> so if you're antigen negative, you don't, you, you know. because the other thing about anything, when you think about um, infection, you have direct laboratory tests and you have indirects. If I culture the bacteria or I, I PCR it or I, look at it and I see it on the microscope. That's a direct test. I see it. You're at, that's active. It's there. If I look at your immune response, that's indirect. So I'm using the, the, the fact that you made an immune response as indirect evidence that you were exposed. But I do, it does not tell me whether you're actively infected or not. And that's true of everything. COVID, strap, everything. That's just how things work. You talked before about the Lyme disease. So once you have the Lyme disease, can you get it again? Yes. But hasn't your body built up antibodies? Yes, it has. But, but again, can you get strep more than once? Can you get a lot of, can you get COVID? The answer is that it's not that you're, 
that you're not immune to it. It's just that the, the, the microorganism changed. So there's co something called strains. It's just like, uh, like many of you probably have had uh, new, the pneumovax vaccine. The pneumovax vaccine, the, the pneumonia vaccine, is multivalent because there's 21 types of, 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 of that pneumo, strep pneumonia, pneumonia that, causes, that causes pneumonia. So, so you're immune to the one, but you're not immune to that. And there's a protein on the surface of, of Lyme disease called outer surface protein C, which is quite variable. And that's, so if, if theoretically, if you had antibody against say type one OSP, uh, you're protected against type one, but you're not protected against type 12, let's say. And would type 12 though be less serious if you had type one? No. Okay. Not because of antibody, but, and the other thing that everybody forgets about is T cells. We don't measure T cells very easily. T cell immunity is really important. And T cells really are, a key element of your immune system. And that's why people, that's probably why um, the COVID vaccines are so effective in preventing death. Because it, there's a lot of myths out there and a lot of nonsense was put out about uh, COVID. Like, oh, your antibodies fade, therefore you don't have an immune response anymore. That's not true, you had T cells. So your T cells are much longer, much longer and you have something called memory B cells which are memory cells that produce antibody under the right circumstances so uh, and you know seeing some of the stuff on TV just drives me crazy <laughs> <laughs> anyway Do you talk to your television? what Do you talk at the television <laughs> no I don't talk at the television <laughs> I ignore it I ignore it I'm very um, critical of uh, things. And I always, when I w see a, a, an expert, I want to know their background. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Could you say something about um, vaccines for children under five for COVID? I could. <laughs> <laughs> I think it becomes an individual de decision. And, and this is going on the internet, so. I have to be very cautious. Okay. And, uh, you know. Got it. Thank you. So, if, if I can say that the mortality rate in children from COVID was exceedingly small. They were not at much risk at all. The children that got sick with COVID tended to be primarily obese or have underlying conditions. So that, that some of the stuff that in COVID, I think, was extremely political. That's an opinion. And opinions don't count for anything. So why don't I wrap up there? Hopefully that was helpful.